And thanks for that intro, Val, and, and, and thanks, Gail, for that, that lovely presentation mm. earlier as well. Brilliant. Uh, right, I'm going to share my screen and I have to make sure I share the right one and I share the sound and I optimise it for video clips. Got some videos to do. Right. Right, welcome. Hello, everybody. Um, what I'm going to talk about is about um, uh, the way that bats inspire us and the way that uh, we can learn things about what, what bats do. Um, going back to uh, the kind of history of bats, this, this is a picture of uh, the, the fossil bat, the Icaronycterus index. And Icaronycterus index uh, is uh, from about 55 million years ago, a million years before present. And it's from the Green River Wy Formation in Wyoming in the States. And it's particularly um, good formation for, for preserving fossils because it's very, very fine grain. So it preserves them with incredible detail. And looking at a Chironicterus index here, this is a fully formed bat. And this is the oldest bat or bat ancestor that we have. You can see its hand wing here. So uh, there's its little thumb and this is its wrist here. And those are all its finger bones and there it's forearm and it's got a little tail. Uh, and here it, it's, uh, you can even see the, the joints there on its ankles. Bats are slightly odd because their ankles have turned around 180 degrees. So their feet effectively face backwards so they can hang on to things. This is a properly fully formed bat uh, 55 million years ago. And if we look at the time timeline here of, uh, of bat evolution, this is Velociraptor at the top. So this is a, a, a sort of fairly typical dinosaur right at the end of the Cretaceous, so just before the, the Chicxulub uh, mass extinction event when the huge uh, uh, asteroid uh, collided with Yucatan Peninsula, just north of Yucatan Peninsula, wiped out most of the dinosaurs. And yet a few million years later, we've got these fully formed bats uh, appearing in the fossil record. So um, chances are they didn't kind of arise overnight. They weren't just sort of suddenly popped into existence, is there will be precursors along here somewhere. So these will be sort of pre or proto bats, but we don't, we've got no idea what those proto bats uh, really looked like uh, because we don't have any fossil evidence for them. Um, and it's almost possible that there are actually these uh, little proto bats or pre bats flying around while the dinosaurs were still kicking around as well. So going back to kind of where bats came from or their evolutionary pathway is if we look at what might be the ancestor of bats there's this sort of slightly strange looking thing down here which is which is the the predecessor of most uh, insectivores and at some point it would have learned to fly probably by climbing up trees and throwing itself out and jumping from tree to tree and gradually it would have developed wing membranes to allow it to sort of flap and glide so at some point, flight would have evolved. We go on a little bit further, and we probably have a branch somewhere which would lead on to what are known as the mega chiroptera. Mega meaning big, chiro meaning hand, terra meaning wing. So the large hand wings, because these, generally speaking, don't echolocate. They're mostly visual um, hunters, hunters in the terms of hunting fruit mostly. And at some point on this other branch that leads to the microchiroptera or small hand wings, echolocation would have evolved, that, that seeing things through emitting sound and sonar. And that would lead up to the microchiroptera or the small hand wing. And um, as, as Gail mentioned, there are some very big bats out there. This is uh, the largest bat in the world, Aceron jubatus from the Philippines. The wingspan is about 1.7 meters, so it's quite a whopper. Mega Choroptera, big hand wing, certainly is big. And this is the smallest bat, again, as Gail talked about, the bumblebee bat, um, Crasionycterus thonglongi. I always think it's wonderful that the smallest bat and candidate smallest mammal in the world has such a fantastically long Latin name. Crasionycterus thonglongi, with about a 15 centimeter wingspan, weighing just a couple of grams. So there's quite a range or a diversity in body sizes and body forms, but mostly the sort of distinction is that we have the mega chiroptera or large wing hand wings and the micro chiroptera. Just to flip back a second in case we have any geneticists um, in the audience, I do have to admit that this distinction between mega and micro chiroptera is a bit of an artificial one, mostly because 
the gen recent genetic evidence suggests that this split is not quite so clean. We don't just have megacoroptera and microcoroptera. Some of the animals that we think of microcoroptera are actually bundled up in the megacoroptera now. Interestingly, if I just go back to my little slide, this tiniest bat, Crasionictrus thonglongii, appears to be more closely related to these things, the large fruit bats, than it is to all of the other smaller microcoroptera. So there's a lot of stuff in terms of the genetics that we need to work out um, using new techniques to try and understand the, the evolutionary history of bats as well. So just going back to my fossil bat, the Chironicterus um, index, this bat could echolocate. And you might say, how on earth can you know that a bat can echolocate when it basically looks like it's been through a panini press? It's completely flat. Well, what you can do is you can put these fossils into very powerful um, CAT scans or CT tomography scans. And you can, you can look in detail using x-rays at the structure of their bones. And what you find is that they actually have very pronounced cochlea. So these are highlighted in this image here. This isn't from this particular bat. This is to show the cochlear structures. The cochlea is the inner ear. It's the bit that is, uh, acts for sound reception and for uh, balance and so on. And in echolocating bats, the cochlea are more developed. They are larger because the bats need them to process sound. So a chironicterus, not only was it a, a fully formed bat in terms of flying around, but also these cochlear structures are very well developed. So we know that it was also an echolocator. Now to show you what a uh, cochlea looks like, we've got a little uh, video here. These are uh, from bats that died from natural causes. I have a, a freezer full of licensed bats which uh, we've used for, for various studies over the years. So they all, they come to me if they've been found sort of dead or they've been injured and subsequently died, often uh, caught by cats, sadly. Um, and we can use them for anatomical studies. And what we did with this particular bat was, uh, this is a Dorbenton's bat. We took it over to the University of Manchester and we were interested in the cochlear structure. And so we put it into a, a very powerful um, engineering X-ray machine that could look in very, very fine detail. Effectively, it's an X-ray microscope. And you can rotate the animal around and you can create a series of images, which means that you can look at it in three dimensions. So I'll just play this. So we can see as the animal rotates, these are the, these are the cochlear structures in here. And comparative, compared to ours, which are actually relatively small compared to our skull size, you can see quite how large uh, they are in this, this particular species because it's an echolocating bat and it needs that high level of processing power. There we go. It goes round again. There we go, finished, right. So I've talked about echolocation a lot. So what is echolocation and, and how might we be able to benefit from it and use it? Quite simply, uh, bats fly in the dark. So you can see behind here, it's very dark. They are not blind. They actually have quite highly sensitive vision. It's sensitive in terms of high levels of sensitivity to light, but their resolution is very poor. So while they can form images uh, and possibly even navigate by the stars, they're not very good at picking out detail. They've got basically dark adapted eyes that are adapted for sensitivity and not resolution. So in a dark environment, um, they need to discover their prey. Uh, it can be fruit. If you're a fruit eating bat, most of the time, most bats are really insectivorous. So you need to find your insect prey. Um, and your insect prey is nocturnal and you are a nocturnal. There's a big debate about why bats are uh, moved into this nocturnal niche, possibly competition from day daylight flying predators, the early birds and so on. So they're in this nocturnal niche and they're trying to find their, their prey. Um, so they have to use some other alternative method apart from vision for locating it. So they've evolved sonar, biosonar. Broadly speaking, very simple process. It works in exactly the same way that if you have reversing or parking sensors on your car, or if you've ever used an electronic tape measure, it works in the same way. What the bat does is it shouts very loudly 
and it shouts using ultrasound, which is too high in frequency for us to hear. And once it shouts, it essentially switches on a little stopwatch in its brain and the sound travels out until it hits an object. In this case, it's a moth. And then the sound bounces off the moth and it travels back again. Why do we use ultrasound? Why do bats use ultrasound? Very short wavelength means it bounces off small objects, off small targets. So if you use long wavelength, low frequency sound, you don't get much echo. Stuff doesn't come back unless you're shouting at something which is much bigger than the wavelength. That's why if you shout at mountains, you yodel, you get echoes back. If you hold up your breakfast and shout at that, you get very little energy back, unless you shout in very short wavelengths, high frequencies, in which case most of the energy bounces back. So that's why bats use an ultrasound. But they time it, so they work at stopwatch starts when the sound goes out, bounces off the object, comes back, stopwatch stops. And what they do is they obviously don't carry out the real calculation, but they work out how long it's taken for the sound to go out and back, essentially divide this, that by two, and that will get you the, the distance because they know what the speed of sound is. Now, obviously they don't work it out in terms of the calculator format. It's all done, your, done, done using neural networks. But the take home message is it's accurate in terms of timing to about six nanoseconds. That's zero and all those other zeros, if as long as they've got the right number of zeros, uh, in terms of accuracy. Uh, so it's incredibly accurate and actually it's probably it's almost more accurate than we're able to measure in terms of engineering and measuring the sort of time it takes for sound to arrive. So it's a very, very, very sophisticated system. And bats process that sound very quickly as well. They have a high number of um, electrical synapses in their auditory system and the, and the part of the brain that deals with sound processing rather than chemical synapses, which are slower. So their electrical synapses allow them to process it much faster as well. So they're processing these sounds at incredibly high speeds and they've got very accurate stopwatches. They also produce sound at incredibly um, high uh, intensity, um, about the same intensity as a pneumatic drill. So about 110 to 120 decibels. And they're producing this about every, every 10, 10 times a second. So 10 times a second, they're shouting at the same intensity as a pneumatic drill. So it's an incredibly uh, energetic process. I mean, if I was shouting at that level, I'd be exhausted um, after a few minutes. But what bats do is they echolocate in flight and they couple the, the wing muscles, sorry, the, the muscles that are controlling their flying, their wing muscles, to the compression in their lungs. So because they're flying already, if those muscles are coupled to their, their lungs, is the same muscles are squeezing the lungs, squeezing the air out of their larynx, and then creating these very, very high intensity pulses. So essentially they get the echolocation for free as a byproduct um, of their, uh, their flights. Now they have a very good sort of range of diverse different call types. Um, this is a long-eared bat. Uh, this has very quiet echolocation calls. So it has very, very big ears to pick up the echoes. This is a horseshoe bat. It actually echolocates not through its mouth, but through its nose. I always think they have look, such gorgeous looking uh, lips down there as well. They're just begging for a bit of red lippy on there. Uh, but a wide range of different call structures. The, the horseshoe bats have uh, very long duration calls. This is frequency up this axis with time. Long calls because the echoes pick up, because they're long duration, they, they pick up the fluttering of the insects. As the insect wings move, they create little acoustic glints that uh, will reflect back. And that, that way the, the bat can tell uh, often the size of the insect, if it's flying slowly because it has slow wing beats, sometimes even species. This bat, the long-eared bat, has got big ears because it's a quiet echolocator. Why would you be a quiet echolocator? Because moths have ears. This is looking at the armpit of a moth, a large yellow underwing moth. And this aperture here, is the moth's bat detector. So moths have got bat detecting ears, not all of them, noctuids and geometrid moths and pyralid moths, but some of the other ones like actually um, hawk moths even have got uh, ears as well, not in their under their wings, but actually in palps on their faces. Because 
bats eat moths. So have a little biological bat detector and you can detect when the bats are going to, going to get you. If we look in detail inside the moth ear, this thin transparent membrane, this is the ear, uh, uh, ear membrane. There's some sense cells here. There's a structure along here that's shaped like a bow that keeps it, it tense. You can demonstrate what moths do when they pick up uh, echolocating bats. If you've got a bunch of keys, go out when it's warm. And if you see moths flying around, you've got a garage light or an outdoor light, take a bunch of keys and then rattle them like that. Keys are fantastic. They produce loads of ultrasound. And what the moth will think is, crikey, it's a bat. And it will do something extraordinary. It will fly off, it will drop to the ground, it will start flying in loops and circles. So you can, you can demonstrate this uh, yourself. It's a lovely thing to do. So just to show you what some bat calls look like, and hopefully you can hear them as well, if I've set up my computer right, all these calls here, uh, we've got, these are called sonograms. You've got frequency up here and time along this axis. And what I've done is I've just slowed the signal down by a factor of 10. If you slow a signal down, you make it last longer, but you drop all the frequencies down as well. So this is a typical bat echolocation call. Rather beautiful sound. Hopefully, if the technology's worked, you'll be able to hear that. Uh, this is what's called a feeding buzz. This is when a bat gets very excited when it's uh, about to capture its prey. And here, this is a, a, a soprano pipistrelle call. We can tell that by the call shape and where the frequency ends up. Um, it's zooming in on the prey and it's about to capture it. Oops. Let's go back up. Sorry about that. There we go. And I'll just play that again because it's lovely. Gets up to about 200 calls uh, per second at the very end there because it's zooming on the prey. It needs to know exactly what the prey is doing at the last minute. These are horseshoe bats, uh, the long duration calls, as I mentioned. So uh, very long duration because they capture the, 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 the movements of the insect's wings. One of my favorites, this is a noctual, very long, low frequency calls. You can almost hear them with the naked ear. Sounds like a kind of wartime submarine sound, I think. And this is the song of love. This is Nathusius's pipistrelle. Uh, and this is a, a male who's got is set in a little hole and he's singing to attract females. And this is what it sounds like slowed down by a factor of 10. Rather beautiful. Okay. Now, all microbats echolocate um, to some extent. So some of them are quiet, some of them are loud, some of them are high frequency, some of them are low frequency. But of the megabats, the megachiropterans, um, it's only bats of the genus Rosettus that echolocate. Most of the other ones don't. So this is, uh, this is Rosettus. Um, this is the Egyptian fruit bat. You can see it has very big eyes because it, rather than echolocating to find um, its prey, it uses vision, this very high sensitivity vision uh, for flying around at night. But why does it echolocate? It echolocates because it roosts in caves. Most other fruit bats roost in trees, but Rosettus roosts at the back of caves where it's dark. So they've evolved an echolocation system. Now their echolocation system is very different to the microbats. This is a, a typical microbat cause, very long duration waveform here. And Rosettus clicks and it clicks with its tongue. So it goes, but it clicks ultrasonically and it has this very strange, very short duration, impulsive 
type structure. So we were interested in this, finding out a little bit more about um, how this works. So what we did was we borrowed some fruit bats from a tropical world in, in Leeds, and we kept them for, for a few weeks. And we developed uh, in conjunction with the University of Edinburgh and Strathclyde, this little bat pack which is a little circuit board with a microphone that comes over the front of the bat and a little aerial. So what we would pick up the echolocation calls the bats produce. So they'd echolocate through their mouth. We'd pick up the signal there. And we'd also pick up any echoes from any targets that we put in the place. So the echo sound would come out, we'd pick it up on the microphone and the echoes would come back as well. And uh, they just were charged up with a little a uh, tiny battery that would last for a few minutes, then we have to replace the battery. So they were just, the bats weren't harmed at all. It was just a little bit of stooky Velcro onto their fur and it would come off at the end of the experiment. Uh, and this is what it looks like. So this is a, a 500 frames per second video. And this little zero down here at the end, if that changes to a one, we know the bat was echolocating. So I'll just play this. So at 500 frames per second, you can see the aerial up here and it's flying towards a target. And we pick up the echolocation call here, there's little one. And we also sometimes picked up the targets as well. There's one, so it's clicking, it's flying along. And it, it uh, lands in a rather ungraceful way towards the end, which I think I've probably cut out of the video. They're not great landers, to be honest. There we go. Stopped at an appropriate moment. So when we looked in detail at these calls, these are the real calls the bat produces, and these are what are called a Gabor function. This is actually just taken, uh, we've, we ran a lot of experiments just outside my office. Uh, in the corridor at uh, Leeds University in the biology building. Um, what is a Gabor function? It's actually a, a mathematical function that says it has the minimum bandwidth or the minimum spread of frequencies for any given duration. In other words, it's optimally positioned to focus the energy into the smallest range of frequencies to give it the best chance of detection. So um, that's these rosettas, it's not just a simple echolocation call at all. It's actually really complicated and beautifully shaped from an engineering perspective to push all the energy into just where the bat needs it. Now, these actually look very familiar if you're in involved in bioacoustics because they are exactly the same signal structures here that dolphins use. So rosettas as a fruit bat has evolved the same call structures that dolphins use in aquatic environments. A wonderful example of uh, of coevolution. So the question is, if e echolocation evolves a number of times, can we actually do it? Um, can human beings do it? And the answer is yes, we do it all the time, we just don't realise it. If we go to the inside of a cathedral and we close our eyes and we listen to the sounds around us, we know we're in a big space because we're aware of the, the way that sounds reverberate. If we go into an anechoic chamber where all the sound is dampened down, it's a very disorientating experience. We don't like it because we lose the sense of awareness of where we are. So we generated, uh, sorry, just to carry on. Uh, one of the other things that you can do, another experiment, is read aloud to somebody or read aloud to yourself. Open a big book, it's got to be pretty big, hardbacks are best, and read aloud. Listen to the sound of your voice and then move the book to one side and you'll hear the tone change because you are aware or you perceive the sound reflecting back off the book. It gives you a sense of space and time. So we were interested in sort of studying this from the perspective of human beings. So what we did was in the real world, we, we, bats work really quickly. Their speed of sound is very fast. They, um, uh, their, their brains operate very quickly. Is um, our brains don't work like that. They're actually much slower at processing sound. But what we can do is we can slow down the speed of sound so that we're better able to, to model whether human beings can actually echolocate or not. We can't do that in the real world, but we can do that in a virtual world. So this experiment here I've shown you a picture of is somebody here is wearing a, a pair of headphones. 
and we can track them using this sphere so we know where they are. And what we do inside this virtual space is we can pop a virtual object. For those people who've ever looked for Pokemon, it's the same principle. We put a virtual thing inside a real space. So this person here can't see this, they don't know where this object is, but it's there in the virtual world, which is a map of their real world. What they then do is they echolocate. In the virtual world, they send out a pulse of sound that bounces off the object and then returns to them. So what they will hear is the same thing that a bat hears. They hear an outgoing pulse and after a while, they hear the returning pulse and their job is they have to find out where this object is and walk to it. Now, if we map where they go, they start off at this point here. We can send the object here is here at these, the crossing of these axes. Is there actually really good? They, they can orientate with respect to it. They can follow the path. They get a little bit confused and they correct themselves and they eventually find the object. Now, we can look and see what they're actually doing, even though they can't see it. So in the virtual world, this is what we see as an observer, although they are working in the dark, they're behaving like a bat. And this is somebody capturing a virtual insect. You can hear the sounds going out and coming back, and you can see what the uh, individual's doing. We're homing on them off, pulse, pulse, outcoming, returning. And I found it. So it turns out human beings are actually really good at echolocating. Now, the question is, the sort of final question is, is if human beings are actually good at, at, at this kind of analysis, can we use some kind of this type te technology to help the blind? So what we did was we created um, the UltraCane. Now, it's a device to help the visually impaired. It doesn't look very impressive to begin with, but bear with me. This was prototype one. And what prototype one did was it had a couple of ultrasound transducers, microphone stroke receivers on the end. And it had a processing board. And what it would do is it would send out ultrasound from uh, these two sensors. It would receive the echoes. The processor would process it and it would send it to a couple of little uh, tactile sensors, the things that sort of vibrate inside mobile phones on the handle. The closer you got, the faster the vibration. And because it was directional, you could steer it and get a sense of where things were in your world. And this is Susan who helped us develop uh, these first prototypes of the Ultra Cane, holding the Mark One. Now, obviously this isn't very uh, appropriate for going to market. So we then developed the Mark II, which was a slightly more advanced version based on a walking stick. And we built the engineer, the uh, electronics to go down here. They looked in three different directions. And also crucially up here, it had one that looked up as well. So it looked in three different directions to the side, but it also had one that looked up. Guide dogs do not look up apparently. So they're very good at going under things that their owners will then walk into. So looking up is actually rather useful. Um, and there we have the handle with the vibrating sensors. There's four of those corresponding to each of the four different microphones. And again, there's Susan with the Mark II. The Mark III was the prototype that we went, went out for, for long-term testing. And that was actually built by people who really genuinely knew what they were doing. And this, this is David, one of our uh, testers here. Uh, again, we've got three sensors looking to the sides and one looking up. Um, and that was a great success. We took lots of uh, feedback and eventually the Mark IV is the one which is now went into production, is now actually still in production as well. So if you do so see uh, somebody who's visually impaired walking with one of these, fundamentally, it was inspired by bats. Um, is there anything else that can we be inspired? I've just talked about bioacoustics and biosonar. Flight is something which can be um, inspired by bats. These is, this is a bat inspired uh, micro aeronautical vehicle or MAV. So there's lots of things that we can be inspired by in terms of creating these or how bats fly. Um, longevity, this is a horseshoe bat here, 30 odd years. It's extraordinary that a tiny animal like this can live so long. There's lots of interesting things locked up in their genetics that allows them to live so long. 
hibernation for potentially for things like space flight. Bats can dip in and out of it. They can do it as and when they want. How do they do it? Well, that's an ongoing set of research. And I'm also going to mention immunity uh, because although bats uh, obviously are possibly the source of the SARS-CoV-19 virus, the reason they're so good at uh, transmitting these viruses is because actually, ironically, they're very immune to them, is that they can carry viruses without expressing the symptoms. So understanding how they do that uh, can possibly help us with the, uh, the generation of new types of vaccines. So I'll just leave you with another little rotating bat. <laughs> And I'll say thanks for listening. <laughs> Thank you.